Hello, I just got back from Gen Con 2023 where I was able to play the first scenario of the Next Evolution campaign. So I was super ambitious on top of everything. I recorded a video Thursday night, the night after I played, got back, it was about 1 a.m. I was gonna edit and my computer could not read the file format. And so I had to wait until I got back to my house on my desktop, I got it edited and here's that video. Hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to Nelson All Over Cards. I am really excited. I'm filming from Gen Con. It is not quite midnight. By the time this video is done recording, it will be over midnight. So I apologize if I sound tired, but I am really excited because I got to play the first scenario of the Marvel Champions Next Evolution campaign that is releasing here in a couple months. At Gen Con this year, they had a uh, kind of a preview event. So it was a ticketed event. You got you had to buy a ticket and you got to experience the first scenario in the five scenario campaign that is coming out. Now, we didn't get to play any of the new heroes. We didn't get to play Cable or Domino, but we did get to play our own decks that we brought to the event. And we played a four player game. We had a, I was running Villain Theory's deck, the King of Hearts, the new Unusual X-Men deck, I think seven. Apologize if that's not correct, but the one where you're sitting in Alter Ego as Gambit for pretty much the entire game and defending for everybody. We had a Cyclops deck, we had an Ironheart deck, and then we also had a, oh my gosh, oh no, um, a Colossus deck. Yeah, and so it was a cool, it was a great four player team up. And I wanted to kind of talk about the scenario, some of the campaign stuff that we got to see. I didn't get to see a lot. I didn't get to see a lot, but I did get to kind of like, you know, see the, the campaign set up because it was set up as the first scenario of the campaign. So it wasn't just that uh, skirmish mode campaign or scenario, but we did get to play like the campaign rules and then also some of the mod sets. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. Um, if it's rambling, I'm sorry, but <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's been a, it's been a long, long day. Um, I'll probably post more about Gen Con on the board game channel, Nelson All Over, so you can find a link to that down below, but let's talk about Marvel Champions and Next Evolution. So the first scenario in the new campaign is the Marauder scenario, and this scenario has seven different villains. So it is a multi-villain scenario, which if you have watched my channel, you know and understand that I absolutely enjoy these multi-villain scenarios because they bring a lot of variety to the table. Each one of these villains activates a little bit differently. And in this scenario, you have to defeat three of them. There are seven, you create a stack, and then you defeat the top three. Now they do have kind of a lower hit point value than a lot of the uh, villains in that we, <laughs> that villains that we see in the game. And so like one of them that we were facing off against, I think the most health that they had was like 10 per player. So 40 health points per player, but you are facing off against three of them. And I think the coolest thing about this scenario, and I will just go ahead and say straight up that I really did enjoy the scenario. I thought it was a lot of fun. I think Tony and the team did an incredible job designing. And I think that it feels different than all the other multi-villain scenarios and all the other different scenarios that we have in Marvel Champions, which just continues to impress me throughout the entirety of this Marvel Champions like career that we've been seeing. Um, but the multi-villain scenario, they have lower hit point totals, but every single one of them has a tough choice that you have to make. So they are all kind of set up as the kind of lower attack values. And so let me give an example. I'll probably throw these up on screen because I took a couple of pictures, but like, I'm just going to look. <laughs> um, so like arc light here has two attack and two scheme on her B side, which is the expert side. And we did play standard through the campaign or through the scenario. And I will talk a little bit about my overall thoughts on the scenario. I want to specifically think about the villains at this point, but like Arclight, just to give an example, was a two scheme, two attack. However, whenever Arclight attacks you or an ally you control. So this does activate if you are chump blocking or anything like that, you have to choose. You can either confuse the character you control with the highest thwart or she gets plus two to the attack. And a lot of the villains follow that same kind of mold where you have to choose between a bad option or like plus X2 attack. And I thought that was a really fun scenario. Now, it did help that we 
Um, we had a lot of toughs going around the table. We had Colossus. And so the plus two attack didn't always feel like the worst scenario in the world. I do think that that kind of scales a little bit harder in the solo play because there's not necessarily the toughs and the chump blocks that can go around all the time. Now, if you build your deck for that, absolutely, you can handle it. But I did think it was a lot of fun in that way because you always had that tough, that tough decision, uh, that, that decision to choose either the plus attack or the negative effect that the villain was imposing upon you. And so I, I thought that was a really cool way to not just give the villain four attack, right? Like we, we have Thanos in the game. He's going to hit like a truck, right? But these villains can't hit like a truck hit really, really difficult. Like I think, uh, who was it? It was Blockbuster over here, right? So he's a one, one scheme, three attack. And then when he attacks you or an ally, you can choose to either give him a tough status card or give him plus three for the attack. And we actually did face off against Blockbuster in our campaign or in our scenario in our playthrough. And it was fun because in a four player game, only one person can give him that tough status card. So three people, as long as all three of you are in hero form, are taking that additional attack. And so you have to have an answer for that. And this on its own, I think is a really cool aspect. What is even cooler, and let's talk about the scenario at this point, is that the scenario that these villains are a part of played into the role of protecting the marauders. And, or uh, not the marauders. Um, hold on, let me look up the, the name of them. Oh my goodness. Um, we don't want to protect the marauders. We want to protect uh, the Morlocks. They're both M words. That's, uh, that had me going for a little bit. Yeah, but we have to protect these Morlocks. And so, at the start of the game, you start on scheme 2A, right? And you can threat out of that scheme, I think that it's six per player, or at, after resolving the step one of the scheme, you place a knock counter on that scheme. And then if there are three knock counters, you progress. So you will progress past the main scheme regardless. It may take three turns, it may take less depending on if you scheme out. But as soon as you go into the second stage, 2A, I think I said 2A already, but yeah, so 1B, 2A, then you get these Morlock allies. And these are the Morlock allies that you're trying to keep. But if you progress through the scheme via knock counters, not via the uh, scheming out, the Morlock allies come in with a tough status card. And this is important because every single time a enemy, villain, minion, whatever attacks you, they instead do not target you as your identity, they target the Morlock ally. And so this requires you to have some sort of defense because as long if you do not have more like allies in play you lose the game it's an alternate loss condition as well as scheming out and so now like colossus was having a pretty tough time at our table because colossus just like to soak these attacks into this tough status card but he can't necessarily do that because he has to actively defend now i did bring the uh, King of Hearts deck from Villain Theory, which is all about actively defending. And so I feel like we did have a fairly decent matchup against this scenario, but it does shake up the meta a little bit. Um, a lot of times we're chump blocking, a lot of times we're soaking with tough, but we do have to actively do that if we don't want to lose these Morlocks. Now, what we kind of figure out towards the end of the game is that these Morlocks were a resource which was pointed out to us changes a little bit in the campaign because not only like you you can win with one more luck on the table but you do have negative implications if you do so and you don't uh if if however many more locks you lose you have negative implications for the remainder of the campaign so you do want to save them um so coming in after stage one with that tough status card is really beneficial because you can take an attack you have a uh, a pass and so that is really nice. They do have five hit points, so they can take a couple of attacks, especially against some of the weaker villains that we've seen in the set. So there are a couple of them on standard that have zero attack. And so we were able to take a couple of those because there are no five boost cards in the, in the recommended mod set, I think actually in the game. But so that was a way that we could take a couple of the attacks on the Morlocks. They can also, you know, scheme and attack so and they can take consequentials. And so in a pinch, they did come out and were able to help manage the board slightly. But really, the entire campaign was around protecting them. And so it 
It felt cool. It felt cool. It was kind of like Robert Kelly from the Sabretooth campaign, which is actually coincidentally the one that I played last year at Gen Con. And so it felt very similar in that vein. However, it felt uh, they, they were more useful. Robert Kelly is fairly useless if, uh, if you play the Sabretooth uh, scenario. But yeah, so that was kind of the idea behind the scenario. And like, there there were a lot of cards in that mod set, but, or not in the mod set, but in the villain set. But the one that I wanted to talk to a little bit before we get into kind of the game end and the, the victory condition of the scenario is the card Hide. And so this is a card that gets shuffled into the encounter deck after you progress to stage two. So it's not in there at the initial uh, start, but once everyone gets the Morlock ally, you have this new card called Hide, which you are able to, as a boost action, give a Morlock a tough status card, or, uh, and then like you resolve another boost card, it, so it kind of surges as that boost card, or if it resolves as an encounter card, it does surge and gives Morlock an, a tough status card. So there are ways to get those tough status cards, and then print it on that, uh, that second scheme, is you can exhaust the Morlock ally to shuffle that card back into the encounter deck. So there's a way to get these tough status cards back. One of the funny things that we had, and I think it was just kind of with our hero makeup and how frequently and how effectively we were able to defend, was the uh, we were flipping that card where we all our Morlock allies had a tough status card. So the the scenario or the effect was a little bit lost. Now I was playing Gambit and I was using my Thief Extraordinaire ability where I was able to kind of see when it was coming I, I could get an idea of when it was coming and when that was coming we would then have one attack or, or or thwart to knock their tough off so that we had a target for it but it was a really cool mechanic to get that back in and it was an encounter card that we've started seeing a trend of recently with the um long shot and a couple other ones that have a positive benefit that are in the encounter deck but they do typically surge and so i thought that was fun and it, it overall, it just felt like a really cool scenario. It felt like something that was kind of different. Um, oh yeah, game end. That's what we, <laughs> that's what I was gonna go ahead and talk about. So the game end wins when you defeat the three. Um, oh my gosh, I have so much more that I want to talk about. Oh my. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm I'm remembering everything now. Yeah. So the game end when you defeat three of the villains and. A lot of the treachery cards and a lot of the side schemes are based off of how many villains you previously defeated. So some of the side schemes, like there's the one, I'm going to look it up right now, and I'll probably throw it up on screen for you all. But there's the one called uh, Marauding Ain't Easy. I don't know how I forgot about that. But it comes in with three threats. However, it has a pseudo hinder ability where it comes in with one threat per player additional based on how many villains are under uh, the routed card. So if you've defeated one villain and you're playing a four player game, now it comes in with seven. If you defeated two, it comes in with 11 threat. And so that's a lot harder to get rid of that amplified token than the first time it came around. Now the first time it came around, it was a lot of fun because Gambit could like Creole Charmer, hit that Confuse, get rid of the Amplify, and we'd be fine. It didn't have any scaling once before one villain was defeated. And once it did have a second villain, or a villain defeated, it got significantly harder to take care of. And a lot of the uh, the side schemes had that. It's so like in the midst of chaos had that. Uh, territorial control had that. However, I don't think we ever saw territorial control. And then there were some um, uh, attachments that also dealt with that. So like bolstered by wrath, uh, you attach it to the villain and they got uh, plus one, plus one. And then it cost extra based on how many... Uh, villains you defeated to get rid of it so like thematically speaking like the more villains you're defeating the harder it is to get rid of the bolster by wrath because they're wrathful right they're they're coming in and they're they're attacking so i really enjoyed the scenario we'll talk about the side schemes but i want to talk about the overall um yeah yeah i want to just talk about the overall scenario because we can swap out the mod sets and everything um overall we played on standard i thought it was a little easy um I don't think that's a bad thing, especially for an introductory scenario. I kind of want the first scenario of any campaign to be a little easy. Um, that being said, I think that this is going to be one of my go-to testing scenarios, just because it has a little bit of everything. It has the threat, it has multi-villain, so you're going to get to see a lot of different activations, and or a lot of different like ways that the villain's going to interact with the game. And you're going to get those tough decisions, so you can have ways that you can take big hits, or you're going to have negative 
impacts on the game. And so I think that right there already makes it feel like a really good first, or not first, well, yeah, it's a good first scenario, but a really good testing scenario for new heroes and ones that I may, or that I will probably be showcasing in the hero spotlight. And so whenever I get a scenario like that, I am really excited. Um, and I think this is one similar to Mansion Attack that it's a the Venn diagram of scenarios that I think are really interesting and really cool, but also work for these hero spotlights that don't have like some sort of like crazy gimmick is fairly small. I think it's kind of Mansion Attack and now uh, this one. And so I, I'm looking forward to adding that into the arsenal that we can use for the hero spotlights. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Overall, on standard, I thought it was fairly easy. Flip those cards over so they have an A and a B side. Um, a side felt fairly easy. B side looked ridiculously tough. There were higher health points, higher attack, higher schemes. And um, I think that is where a little bit of the easiness came in. Now, I do think we brought four very, very good decks to the table. And like when you take four very good decks with four very good players and you match them up against standard, I think that, you know, you're kind of expecting an easy scenario against that. Um, I feel like it's just kind of uh, bragged on myself a little bit. That's not what I meant to do. But anyways, uh, so I think there was a little bit of that. So I'm I'm looking forward to playing more of it and seeing if that um, kind of kind of pro uh, finishes up. I, I wow, I can't speak. Uh, I, feel, I I'm looking forward to see if that continues on to feel like it's an easy scenario because I do think that once you flip it over to expert, it does get a lot more difficult. And so, yeah, I, I think it was. I think it was a really good scenario overall. Again, I think the design team is doing a fantastic job of making each of these scenarios feel uh, unique and very satisfying to play. Now, that was the Marauder scenario. Um, I want to talk about the um, the campaign stuff that I saw, and which I didn't take a picture of, so I'm not actually going to be able to take a or uh, speak too, too um, proficiently on that. And then I also wanted to talk about some of the mod sets. So let's talk about the campaign real quick. And basically what I could understand about it is that there are player side schemes that start in play and you get to choose one of these player side schemes, I think each scenario of the campaign. And I think there were six to choose from and each of them have a very positive effect. So the one that we chose, once you thwarted it down, I think it was three threat per player. Once you thwarted it down, everyone got to put, search their deck and discard pile for a three cost ally and put it into play. This was a campaign size game, started on the table. Awesome. And maybe those start, maybe, now I'm speculating because I actually have no idea. I did not actually get to read through the rule book, but I'm speculating at this point. But the way that they were worded, it may come up in future scenarios where you get to start with the unlocked ability on the table. Maybe. Who knows? Um, but there were, there were some other ones around there that kind of all had those same positive benefits, getting new um, upgrades or supports or stuff like that, that kind of mutually benefited the entire table. But it is kind of that side quest. Everything that we've seen about player side schemes, this feels exactly like that, except it starts on the table. It does take up that player side scheme spot. It is labeled a player side scheme. So in like solo one, solo or two player, you cannot have another side scheme on our player side scheme in play until you get rid of that. Um, three or four player, you can have two. So I thought that was a really cool way to do that. And something that I'm looking forward to in the campaign of choosing, when do I want to choose those specific benefits to you know, get the most bang for my buck. When do I need an ally on the table? Is that going to be against Juggernaut? Probably, actually, probably not. That was a bad example because he has overkill. But so trying to figure out exactly when and where to use those specific side schemes um, and have those benefits going forward in the campaign, I'm really looking forward to. The last thing that I wanted to talk about today on this video is the mod set that we use. Now we used the mod set, it was called Military Grade, and I, I thought this was a cool mod set. I thought that it's all about attachments, and there are two attachments for the villain and two attachments for your hero. Let's talk about the hero attachments. These are the same. There are two copies of these. They're called Inhibitor Collar, and it says attach your identity, and you have to treat your identity's text box as if it were blank. So for, like, Hulk, 
awesome. We like that, right? But I was playing Gambit, I got the inhibitor collar, and I really wanted to use my Thief Extraordinary ability, so I had to use get rid of this. And it was, uh, as an action, choose to either exhaust a character you control, um, or take three damage to discard this card. And then any player can do this, so thematically you're pulling this off, right? It also gives you a minus one attack, so maybe actually Hulk doesn't like it. Um, I was doing the Alter Ego Gambit thing, so I didn't really care about the minus one attack. Um, so this was a cool way to kind of mess with the hero card without completely locking them down, right? You could get rid of it. It was fairly easy, right? You can exhaust a character you control um, or take three damage to get rid of it. And so like it wasn't the end of the world. It was just an annoyance. But um, on, the other, on the other side, we had two... Villain attachments, there was Titanium Exoskeleton, um, where the attached enemy cannot take more than two damage uh, in a single attack, and you have to spend three resource of any type or remove um, a Confuser Stun status card from the attached enemy to discard this card. I just realized we read that wrong in our playthrough. We read that as and, which makes it a lot harder. But So you can spend three resources or remove one of those uh, the Stunner Confused status cards to remove this. And then finally, the last one is the Heavy Armament. This one was the big boy. It gave you plus two attack. You attached it to the enemy with the highest um, attack. They gave him Retaliate too. And then after you attack the attacked enemy, uh, spend two resources of the same type to discard this card. This is a big card, right? So you're getting plus two attack, which is already significant, and Retaliate too. But what's the, 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 the hardest part about this is you must attack in order to remove it. And so after you attack the attached enemy, so you have to take that retaliate two damage in order to remove this. So regardless, it is at least doing two damage, or if you can mitigate it somehow, you can do that. But it's a it was a tough card. And then the uh the senator's support, which is that fifth card in the mod set, is the mean one where it uh hinders one, comes in with three, and amplify you so you can't leave it out there. You really want to get rid of it. But when defeated, the first player discards cards until they get an attachment and they put it back. And so now I'm really looking forward to running this in like the crossbone scenario or the, um, yeah, pretty much the crossbone scenario. I guess Zola could be really interesting, right? Because you can throw this and you're going to get those attachments. But the way that this is worded is it could pull out the attachments in that specific um, mod set. Or if you're playing with a villain that has uh, some other attachments, you this can pull that and so and you you have to get rid of it as an amplify you really can't uh sit with an amplify on the table for that long uh without feeling too much pressure and so i thought that was a really cool uh way to handle that and just see more of those cards or see more of the villain or other mod sets that you're playing with depending on who you are playing but yeah that was the the scenario i thought it was awesome oh yeah and we got promo cards so there were promo cards. I posted a picture of the promo cards, but they are promo double resources for Captain Marvel and Spider-Man. They're alt art of the Energy Genius Strength, and they have all the, the cool arts. I'll probably throw some video up here. You're probably seeing that right now. Um, I honestly didn't know that we were getting that, so that was really fun to have Tony come around and hand these out to everyone that was playing. So that was really, really cool. Um, yeah, overall, I am hyped for this box. I think it comes out just in a couple weeks. I am really looking forward to playing more of the scenarios. Honestly, I was really excited for the Marauders. I'm still, I think I'm most excited for Juggernaut. I think that's going to be the one that I'm really looking forward to. But with all that being said, we got just a couple weeks before we get some more. I will be playing a lot of it on the channel. So I'm looking forward to getting that to the table. If you are looking forward to that as well, go ahead and subscribe and we will be live streaming and posting those videos in just a few weeks. I'm so pumped. We'll also be playing some cable and domino. So here we are. Anyways, it is late now and I, it's only Thursday. I'm recording this on Thursday. I, I hope to get it posted on Friday, which means that I need to edit it tonight, which means that I'm going to be really tired tomorrow. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just really wanted to sit down and just kind of give a first impressions, first thoughts on the next evolution, first scenario, the Marauders campaign or the Marauders scenario. And just I'm I'm really hyped on this game. I'm really looking forward to uh, everything that's coming. I'm going to log off. I appreciate you all. Thank, thank you all so very much. And I'll see you around. Peace.